Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the theater. When discussing crime, the notion of justice becomes unavoidable. And by justice, I mean the punitive kind, where a prison sentence or even a capital punishment is served. For many, the concept is simple, even intuitive. It's an eye for an eye, where you get what's coming to you, an otherwise complex moral topic waved off by idioms. And justice should be simple, theoretically. You commit a crime, and a court tallies up the number of months or years in accordance to the crimes committed. But there's one hiccup here. Punitive justice can really only make sense if we are in agreement of what kind of reality we live in. That is, a reality wherein we as individuals possess free will. Just like it was taboo to be sacrilegious in the Middle Ages, to suggest that the world may not be the creation of a divine, omnipotent creator. Today, it is taboo to even suggest the notion that free will does not exist. But for today's story, you may be surprised just how easy it is to play devil's advocate here. Regardless of one's religious beliefs or lack thereof, even to the most forward-thinking individuals, this idea of determinism can feel offensive. It goes against our deeply held intuitions that we are the arbiter of our thoughts, and so long as we have control over these thoughts, we choose our actions, and therefore our destinies. Anything else would be ridiculous, right? Therefore, any mishap or mistake we make along the way is wholly ours to own, just as is our successes and triumphs. But in some scientific and modern philosophical inquiries, it's been noted that free will isn't exactly cohesive with the underlying physics of our reality setting aside the discomfort or the intuitions it disturbs. This idea that free will doesn't exist really isn't a radical one, and the implications of this have drastic effects on the structures in place that govern the modern world. What kind of world would that look like after all? Well, if free will didn't exist, we would have no reason to hate criminals. Just like we don't hate a bear for attacking someone, we would have no reason to hate a human who inflicted harm on another. They would still be responsible for their actions, and choice still exists, but punishment does us no good here. And without punishment as a rational consequence, all we would have to care for is figuring out the most humane and effective techniques of correcting their behavior, as we have no reason to punish anyone for simply being who they are. Wonderfully, this also only gives us logical reason to sympathize and have compassion for such people. Nevertheless, the blood they spilt, the harm they committed, would need to be righted. But without a way to rehabilitate these individuals so they can function in the modern world, we are left with the same solution we began with, to imprison them and safeguard society against their predilections. A punishment, whether we intend it or no. So let's step away from the hypothetical. So long as we cannot solve the complex neurological or psychological precursors which cause somebody to be a killer we have no path to salvation. With or without free will, we are damned to face the great irony that within each of us is the potential to become a monster, a potential that is genetic, environmental, even happenstance in nature. But that potential will always be a reality for some, a reality that we cannot always readily solve, make sense of, or easily explain. The fact remains, we live in a dark world, but the darkness is from a shadow, a shadow cast by us. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and you are listening to the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. Charles Whitman had a seemingly unremarkable childhood. Despite the domestic violence that he grew up in, he was described as being a polite child who seldom lost his temper, and more importantly, with an IQ of 139, academic achievement became an important trait to the young boy. With an angular face, sharp jaws, and blonde hair, Charles was poised for a successful life, brought up by a strict temperamental father who would implement corporal punishment to keep his son disciplined. But of course, Simply by having his story told on this show, we know that Charles's fate is a dark one, foreshadowed by nothing better than the frequent hunting trips he and his father went on. His father was a firearms collector and enthusiast, 
Just as Charles was a keen student, when he applied his mind to shooting, he quickly became an avid hunter. His father even said he could plug the eye out of a squirrel by the time he was 16. Though Charles was excelling both in his hobbies and academics all throughout his adolescence and his early adulthood, the domestic violence at home eventually boiled over. A month after Charles's high school graduation in June of 1959, Charles had gone to a party with fellow classmates and, understandably, came home intoxicated. And let's not forget that this is after the school year had ended. Nevertheless, Charles's father, being a staunch Catholic and a disciplinarian to boot, he beat his son and threw him into the family swimming pool. A month later, without letting his family know, Charles chose to remove himself from the authority of his father and replace it with one that would only regiment him further, the Marines. Charles left home on July 6th of that same year for an 18-month tour of duty that his father failed to prevent by calling a branch of the federal government, an attempt to have his son's enlistment canceled. And thus, what was once an after-school activity, a hobby, between father and son, became a verifiable talent. Charles earned the Marine Corps' Expeditionary Medal, along with a sharpshooter's badge, achieving 215 of 250 possible points on the marksmanship test. But ultimately, Charles's short career in the military is not what shapes nor defines the unexpected tragedy which gave him infamy and destroyed the lives of his victims. With a scholarship from the military, Charles attended the University of Texas at Austin. The University of Texas's main building is heralded by this remarkably grand clock tower rising up from behind it. It is grand not in its architectural sense, it is somewhat plain, if not beautiful in its simplicity, but grand in the sense of its size and the neat bell tower at the top, just above its clock faces. Charles himself once remarked to his peer, a person could stand off an army from atop it before they got him. To the horror, of many, Charles would go on to test this theory. But what sets Charles apart from other killers is just how unusual his inclination is. Shortly before his infamous spree, Charles was seeing a psychiatrist. In fact, he had seen a minimum of five doctors for an unexpected medical problem which arose between the fall and winter of 1965. Charles was experiencing frequent headaches, a splitting, unendurable pain that standard over-the-counter pain relievers weren't helping with. More troubling, Charles even mentioned in his suicide note that he talked for about two hours trying to convey to a psychiatrist of overwhelming violent impulses Impulses he never had as a child, nor a teenager. Never even in his training and career as a Marine. He went on in the note saying, I have been fighting my mental turmoil alone, seemingly to no avail. It was as though Charles was being corrupted by something, an outside force that he had no control over, and though he was recognizing it, was absolutely victim to it. In the psychiatrist's notes, it was written, He readily admits of having overwhelming periods of hostility, with a very minimum of provocation. Repeated inquiries attempting to analyze his exact experiences were not too successful, with the exception of his vivid reference to, quote, thinking about going up on the tower with a deer rifle and start shooting people, end quote. After the winter, Charles began doing something that filled him with self-loathing. Having been scarred in his childhood, Charles was determined not to be like his father. And yet his sudden, violent impulses began to emerge. As a result, he struck his wife on two occasions. Unlike his father, Charles did not take this lightly. He despised himself for this, and in his personal journal, confessed to his mortal fear of being like his father. But this abuse would quail in comparison to Charles' final day amongst the living. A day that he catalogued almost as if in the margins of a daily planner. On July 31st, 1965, Charles punched into his typewriter the time, 6.45 p.m., and wrote, I 
I do not quite understand what it is that compels me to type this letter. Perhaps it is to leave some vague reason for the actions I have recently performed. I do not really understand myself these days. I'm supposed to be an average, responsible, and intelligent young man. However, lately, I cannot recall when it started, I have been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. These thoughts constantly recur, and it requires a tremendous mental effort to concentrate on useful and progressive tasks. Just after midnight, Charles drove to his mother's apartment, who had by now lived on her own following her divorce. Charles knocked her unconscious before stabbing her through the heart, and beside her body he left another note, to whom it may concern. I have just taken my mother's life. I am very upset over having done it. However, I feel that if there is a heaven, she is definitely there now. But I am truly sorry. Let there be no doubt in your mind that I love this woman with all my heart. After writing this note, he placed her body on her bed and covered it with sheets, and returned to his car, and in the pitch blackness of 3 a.m., he drove back to his own home. His wife was sleeping when he returned. Having found her like this, he stabbed her three times in the heart, and just like his mother covered her with sheets. Of course, the task would not be complete until he continued his note from earlier that evening, writing, I imagine it appears that I brutally killed both of my loved ones. I was only trying to do a quick, thorough job. If my life insurance policy is valid, please pay off my debts. Donate the rest anonymously to a mental health foundation. Maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. If you can find it in yourselves to grant my last wish, cremate me after the autopsy. This is crucial. Charles was suspicious of his own behavior, and specifically requested in his note to be autopsied. But the rest was a sleepless night, one full of contemplation, dredged in the horror of what he'd done. Charles was a walking nightmare he himself was failing to comprehend, one that he feared and simultaneously embodied. He was the silence in the dark of early morning, the creeping shadow of threat. He was all of its deadliness and none of its malice. He was the fatal edge of a blade, the trajectory of a bullet with none of the true intention. He was merely the flesh of a murderer with none of its soul. At 11.35 a.m., Charles went to the University of Texas identifying himself as a research assistant, telling security he was there to deliver equipment. But what was in his bag was a rifle, food, water, and several boxes of ammunition. Charles put his talent to practice. He killed 14 people and wounded 31 in just 96 minutes. But unlike his prediction, he was not quite able to fell an army before being shot himself and killed by police officers. It's at this point you must be wondering why I've gone out of my way to describe Charles the way I have. Merely the skin of a murderer with none of its soul. Now I'm no expert, but for the sake of mania, I have spent many long evenings reading into the minds and motives of unsavory individuals, and Charles is not necessarily one of them. He even said to himself, I'm supposed to be an average reasonable, and intelligent young man. Modern killers like Ed Kemper, Ted Bundy, and Jeffrey Dahmer knew who they were in the context of modern society. They knew they had sexual desires and violent urges that were not only immoral, but were considered inexplicable and evil to everyone, and they made no bones about it. Ed Kemper even went out of his way to turn himself in having realized that there was something wrong with his mind, his inner wirings, and so sacrificed his freedom so as to protect society from himself. But Charles was a mystery to himself. He was dumbfounded, so much so that he left a log of his actions the day of the massacre, smart enough to know that, though he couldn't control nor understand his impulses, he could give the world a trail of breadcrumbs to follow. And the world did. As was requested in his suicide note, 
an autopsy was performed on Charles. A mortician at the funeral home that received his body was the first to perform it. He found a tumor in his brain, but noted that it wasn't malignant enough to affect his behaviors. But then another team of doctors descended on the case, re-examining the tumor, discovering that it was in fact pernicious, and that, given the nature of the tumor and how it was pressing upon his amygdala, a part of the brain considered to regulate flight or fight and emotions, it was no small wonder that Charles did what he did. No less shocking, of course, but it begs the question, how might you, or I, or anyone, behave if they had a malignant tumor pressing up against their amygdala? Some might even say Charles quarreled longer and harder against the impulses than many would. Having discovered this, we begin to see Charles as much a victim as anybody else. How can we possibly fault him? Can we blame him for letting the tumor grow, for being there in the first place? He even went to a psychiatrist, expressing in painful detail what he wanted to do at the clock tower. The psychiatrist refused to take this seriously. So can we blame him for not trying to seek help? No. Before we conclude today's show, I'd like to compare Charles to Mary, or murderous Mary, if we were to go with the name the tabloids gave her. Mary was around long before Charles, and was quite a lot bigger and more dangerous even, given the fact that she wasn't human, but an elephant. Mary worked at Charles Sparks' world-famous circus show. On September 11th, 1916, Mary was prodded by an inept rider who happened to prod her precisely at a spot where she had a tooth infection. This caused her to fly into a rage in the middle of a show, whereupon she snatched up her amateur trainer, throwing him against a drink stand with her trunk before stomping on his head. A murderous mob soon began chanting, Kill the elephant! Let's kill it. A man from the crowd even shot bullets into the elephant long after its temper had subsided. Two days later, the circus owner, Charlie Sparks, that's a hell of a name by the way, swayed by the terrible rage of both the press and the people, decided to kill the elephant in public to execute it. And so the elephant was hanged. There was a hanging for an elephant. A crane even had to be used, and it took two attempts in total. The chain broke the first time. Like a public execution we've heard about in past episodes, throngs of people had gathered to watch this justice be performed. Now, by today's standards, we know that this is barbaric and absurd. We don't blame the elephant for killing his trainer that day. We don't even blame the elephant for being in the circus. We see the tooth as a natural domino in the tumbling causes and effects that led to her deciding to stomp his skull around a crew of clowns and a shocked audience. And our code of ethics, I believe, have advanced that we can even pity someone like Charles Whitman, knowing full well that the chaotic nature of the universe's dice could have just as easily given one of us that tumor. The poignant questions, and eerie ones, I'll say, start to arise. What is the difference between the logic behind hating that circus elephant and someone like Charles Whitman? And at what point does the chaos of our inner workings translate into autonomy, into free will. The practical application of this rigorous critique of our sense of justice and punishment becomes amplified when we apply it to any action of far less dramatic consequences. Somebody bumping our car on the roadway, perhaps. A friend or family member forgetting a birthday. Somebody saying something insensitive online. It is more critical than it seems, I think, to lend a degree of patience and understanding to the notion that there are always factors outside of an individual that are influencing how they behave, act, and think. And I truly believe that this is imperative for a society existing in the shadow of itself. And the sooner we understand this, the less embarrassment we'll have to suffer. Looking back on newspapers commemorating the day where we were mad enough, foolish enough, and ignorant enough to hang an elephant. Thank you very much for joining me for another episode of Mania. For this episode, there is nothing to discuss regarding the factual or fictional nature of the stories, as it is entirely non-fiction. 
and you'll notice that it is the most modern recount um, to date for the show. This is something that constantly bothers me when researching serial killers, the idea of free will and what, what kind of life are they set up to live exactly. Many of the people that we, we look into, you know, really weren't handed the best cards, and they're, they're doing their best to work with them. And many of them end up doing horrible things, horrible things that really there's no excuse for. Yet at the same time, you have to wonder, you know, how could it have been any other way? Is it truly their, their fault? Or is fault merely a function of, of saying who committed the act? I find it rather tragic, actually. And it affects me quite deeply to think of it. I think that we have a very um, misguided way of looking at killers and, and, and criminals. And I believe that our, our hatred and our loathing of these people is, is often there purely because they are you know, doing harm to people that we love, people that we empathize with, and merely for the fact that they are also human. We have this really intense, almost tribal uh, vilification of them, very instinctual and dangerous. I didn't mean to go on that rant, um, but this is, you know, one of the things that I, one of the main reasons why I even started this podcast to begin with. Of course, we could be talking about this for, for hours and days. And of course, it wouldn't be an episode without thanking all of the sponsors of this show, which really are just you, the listeners. If you want to support Mania, please go to patreon.com forward slash harlequingrim, or you can go to thegrimtheater.com and purchase some goodies, some prints, something to decorate your home with, or a a um, <laughs> collection of clown stickers, which have been very popular recently, actually. This whole project, The Grim Theater, is nothing without its people supporting it. I thank everyone for all their interest in just being here to listen. If nothing else, that is that already means the world to me. So thank you, and as always, the theater is ever welcome to you. <laughs>